All right, all right, all right. You five folks have waited long enough. Quick disclaimer, this video is a follow-up. Check out what went wrong with Harry Potter and the Cursed Child for the full story. Let's get it poppin'. So last year I put out a really long, really monotone, really weirdly successful video about the shortcomings of the West End stage play Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. In the video we discussed the shortcomings of the play's storyline, and I dropped a few hints about what I would have done that might have worked better. So without further ado, allow me to formally re introduce myself. My name is Austin, and today I'm going to fix Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. So for the purposes of this video, let's push a hypothetical. Suppose Jack Thorne and John Tiffany called me up and said, you know what, homie, you're onto something. Let's meet for lunch. I fly out to London, we hit up the local hibachi restaurant, and they give me the 411. Here's the sitch, McConnell. You think you can do better than us? Prove it. Then they bounce, leaving me the check and drive off in a blue 2015 Honda Civic, leaving me with a director's credit and no working capital. Does that sound oddly specific? Anyway, so here's the challenge. I've got to fix the show, but I'm only allowed to use the cast, crew, sets, and props that are already in-house. No new cast, no new budget, no elaborate gimmies. I just have to take what the show is currently using and rework it in a way that provides a better experience. Alright, so I'll give the source material one thing. The first few scenes are actually pretty good. We're keeping them. Albus gets sorted into Slytherin, befriends Scorpius. Their first two years at Hogwarts pass by uneventfully. Story is basically going to be the same up to Act 1, Scene 5. Just one little fix before then, each platform 9 and 3 quarters scene needs to set up a contrast between Al and Harry that grows deeper and deeper as Albus's school years progress. Harry needs to set up great expectations for his son that wind up never happening. So before each train ride, we should get something like like this. First year, big year. I remember my first year, all kinds of adventures. Did I ever tell you the story about the Mirror of Erised? Okay, son, second year. It's a big year. My second year was tough, but you'll do better. I remember our defense against the dark arts teacher, Gilderoy Lockhart. Did your mother ever tell you about him? Of course, that was the year I saved her life. Something along those lines. If you're going to use Harry's son, then Harry needs to function as the struggling father figure. Think about it. He's the most famous wizard who's ever lived. He saved the world. His school experience was unlike any other. So as amazing as his life story has been, he is woefully ill-equipped to connect with his son or anybody on a regular level. Hearing his father's exploits over and over again should place pressure on Albus to live up to his father's iconic stature. That way, his complete and utter failure at wizardry in his first few years will have a greater impact. Albus should act as a bit of a character foil to Harry. As a wizard, Albus should be a dud. We should see him struggle to cast the most basic of spells. We should witness him making a conscious effort to avoid trouble, to avoid being a hero. Albus as a failed wizard is the opposite of the audience's expectations, and thus it becomes more compelling to watch. Every main character needs a story arc. Albus's story is the story of failed expectations. At Hogwarts, Albus earns the nickname The Cursed Child because of his total inability to perform some of the most rudimentary skills required of wizardry. To be honest, I like the way that the West End play sets Albus's characterization up. He's moody, he lacks leadership skills, he has trouble making the right decisions, and has a general lack of self-confidence. This is gold. In our story, we'll play this up more. So let's head to scene five. I've said before, this is the most squandered opportunity of the entire stage play. It takes place in Harry's office at the Ministry of Magic. Hermione, the new minister, is busily cleaning up Harry's desk when he walks in, sporting a fresh cut on his cheek. Harry's a big bad wizard detective nowadays, and he's just back from his recent mission. As the scene is written in the original script, the two share some playful banter back and forth, we get some exposition about a time turner, and that's pretty much it. Harry heads home. So here's how my fix starts to really change things. In the original script, midway through Harry and Hermione's conversation, we get this weird moment between the two where she offers him some toffee to eat. Maybe it's just the way my mind works, but when I first read that part, my mind immediately immediately went, wait a minute, are they having an affair? Guess what, in my version, they absolutely are. In my version, toffee is a little code word they use around the office. Get it? 
Harry turns the offer down, he's not really feeling up for it at the moment, and they continue their usual conversation. So we place little subtle innuendos like this throughout the next few scenes, never explicitly stating that they have something going on until we show it later. Doing this leaves the audience at the edge of their seats in anticipation any time these two share a scene together. The audience is thinking to themselves the whole time, wait a minute, are they or aren't they? Why add an affair subplot? Simple, because it immediately raises the stakes of the story. In Thorne and Tiffany's version, they really only develop the new characters. The original trio, they take a back seat. That makes the cursed child seem less like a passing of the torch and more like a cheap fanfic. Somebody should occlude Thorne and Tiffany into something. Nobody bought tickets to see the misadventures of Harry's son. They want to see Harry. It's his name in the title, you dig? So give him and the characters we grew up with something to do during the story. Expand them as characters. Give them a new and interesting conflict. Quit playing it safe by only really raising the stakes for characters we don't really care about. The introduction of Harry and Hermione carrying on a secret affair not only gives a little fan service to folks who supported the pairing, but also establishes that Harry, Ron, and Hermione aren't little kids anymore. They've got grown-up problems, and in a grown-up world, not everything's always black and white. Good versus bad, Harry versus Valdi. If I had turned the page of my book and found out that Harry and Hermione had a secret side thing going on, I would have immediately been like, You've gotta be kidding me, they're actually gonna give us a mature love triangle in a Harry Potter story. Turns out, nope, she's seriously just offering him candy to eat. Do things my way, we change that. So they continue on in their conversation and Harry gives his report. A group of masked vigilantes stole an ancient magical artifact from a museum in, I don't know, Nocturne Alley or someplace. What's the artifact? No idea. Don't know, don't care. Maybe it's a Deathly Hallow, maybe it's some weird mind control necklace, maybe a ring that gives the wearer the ability to petrify or curse people. It doesn't really matter, we just need some kind of object to get the conflict going. We'll call it the Magical MacGuffin. Harry was able to stop a few of the thieves and arrest them, but the leader of the group got away with the MacGuffin. Harry planned to interrogate those captured and find out what the master thief is planning. Finish the scene off by having Hermione looking longingly into his eyes or some such nonsense and bidding him good night and good luck with his investigation. Harry hops in the telephone booth and leaves, cut to black, scene over, and immediately the story is ten times better than the one we had before. The audience has all kinds of questions swirling around in their heads, and they're glued to the story. Are Harry and Hermione secretly an item? Does Ron know? What happens if he finds out? What happens when he finds out? Ugh, what happens when Jenny finds out? Who is this new mysterious enemy? What's the magical MacGuffin gonna be used for? And how do all the kids factor into this? Think about it, were you asking any of those types of questions at the end of this scene as it's originally written? Nah. Stage lights lift up, and we're at platform nine and three quarters with Harry prepping Al for year number four. Same routine. Ah, <sighs> fourth year, big year. In my fourth year, the Triwizard Tournament happened. Did I ever tell you about my friend Cedric Diggory? <sighs> yes, Dad. Everyone tells me all the time. And at that point in our story, Cedric Diggory's name is never uttered again. While getting everybody set for their next year at Hogwarts, Al and Harry finally have it out. Picture the big blow-up the two had in Thorn and Tiffany's version. Except in our story, it doesn't take place at the Potter's house in Al's room. It takes place right here, right on the platform, in the middle of everything, surrounded by the hustle and bustle of all the wizards families in Britain. Everybody stops what they're doing, they turn and they watch the two scream at each other. A few folks from the Daily Prophet are there, and they start snapping photos of the argument. It's a total disaster. Right at the climax of the fight, there's a huge explosion. Masked vigilantes swarm in and the platform is suddenly under attack. Harry instinctively moves to protect his son, and a huge firefight breaks out. Maybe Al even steps in to try and help out, but he's quickly disarmed and nearly killed by one of the terrorists. In a split second, Harry has to save his son's life, and in a flash of parental protection, he doesn't hit the assailant with a stupefy. He uses the big, bad, unforgivable one for the first time in his life. Avada Kedavra! The attacker drops dead right at the feet of Albus. The masked menaces turn tail and flee, but not before putting up a dark mark. Kill all the lights in the theater. The only light that the audience can see is the green skull up in the rafters. We then quietly begin to hear various news reports about the event. 
whispers that Voldemort has returned, Harry being investigated for using the unforgivable curse, and a few tabloid stories about he and Al getting into a fight just before the incident, the whole thing climaxes in a familiar whisper from the Dark Lord himself. <laughs> Harry snaps awake the next morning in a cold sweat. He has a heart-to-heart with Ginny and then heads to the trial. Hermione manages to pull a few political strings, and Harry avoids any real charges. The Ministry then convenes. They have to try and figure out a plan to face this new enemy. The MacGuffin is allowing the assailant to avoid capture, and Harry leads the investigation to track down the culprit. Next scene then takes us back to Hogwarts. Al, Scorpius, and Rose are all trying their best to put the events at the train station behind them as they start their fourth year. Turns out there's a new transfer student named Delphi. She looks a little older for her age, and pretty soon Al and Scorpio are both smitten beyond words. Delphi's put in Ravenclaw or some such, and pretty soon she's turning up the charm to Eleven to try and woo the son of Harry Potter. I'm not getting paid to give you all the play-by-play, -play, so I'll just hit the highlights of the rest of the story. You get an A-plot and a B-plot, Team Young Guns and Team OG. While Harry and company are trying to solve the mystery of the new big baddie, Al, Scorpius, and Rose are getting into more and more hijinks as the year goes on, Delphi in the middle of all of it. See, Al's boring school days are at an end once she comes on the scene. Think near-death mishaps like... <laughs> but of a slightly more PG-13 variety. Delphi gets Al to sneak out of the castle one night for a little romantic rendezvous, and before they know it, they're cornered in the Forbidden Forest by the Masked Menaces. I really need to come up with a better name than Masked Menaces. How about the New Death Eaters? I guess that works. They end up being rescued by Headmistress McGonagall, if you really need a cameo, and despite Al's best efforts, he's quickly becoming bad news bears around the castle. While all that's going on, Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Jenny are on the trail of the the enemy and investigating a slew of murders. Seems like the new Death Eaters are hunting down one by one some of the key figures that led to the fall of Valdi. Former Death Eaters, Turncoats, Aurors, all of them are winding up dead, thanks in part to the magic skill boost of the MacGuffin. Part 1 should end something like this. Team OG finds out that the leader of the new Death Eaters is actually, you guessed it, Delphi. Turns out she's not some transfer student, but a 50 or 60 year old sorceress who's using the MacGuffin to operate into and out of Hogwarts undetected, all the while using ancient wizardry to mask her appearance. About that time, Rose finds out the truth on her own and confronts her. Delphi attacks Rose, but a feuding Scorpius and Al get there just in time to have her back. Harry and crew show up as well, and we've got an all-out showdown. During the battle, Delphi curses either Ginny or Ron with some unknown spell and then gets away. Curtain falls with Rose rescued, Harry or Hermione holding their significant other in their arms, and the future uncertain. Part 2 is the fallout. Jenny, or Ron, is in constant pain and torture from Delphi's curse. They're sent off to St. Mungo's, and it looks like there's no real hope for them to be cured, at least until Delphi is defeated. Harry and Hermione are forced to come clean about their affair to their respective families, and Jenny, or Ron, whichever one isn't cursed, obviously, packs their bags and leaves, unable to forgive them for the betrayal. Hermione faces huge political backlash for the attack at Hogwarts, and Al, guilt-ridden by the fact that a Death Eater deceived him, sets out with Scorpius and Rose to get their revenge. Hermione's main political opponent, let's use this guy, hires private investigators to dig up dirt to try and oust her as minister as the opposition party no longer feels she has the ability to lead in the face of the new enemy. Guess what they find? Yeah. They blackmail Harry and Hermione about the affair, and both of them resign to avoid the public finding out. Our heroes have now either lost all their power or direction. Delphi continues her reign of terror on the world at large and soon gains a reputation on par with you-know-who himself. Either way you slice it or dice it, each one of those scenes I just described is grounds for amazing dialogue and character development that rivals, and in some cases, exceeds that of the original books. Point is, everything is broken in the beginning of part two, and it looks like all hope is lost. The young one's road trip adventure puts them face to face with some truly evil enemies, and they level up along the way. 
Al gains a new perspective on how hard life is and was for his pops, and the two inevitably reconnect. Harry is fresh out of a job, but he's still pulling a few strings and getting info on where Delphi might be to exonerate himself. So at the climax, father and son finally make up and join up, and Team Young Ones and Team OG work together to track down Delphi, and there's a final showdown, in which the group is rescued at the last minute either by Ron or Ginny, whichever spouse left at the beginning of part two, and the battle is won. Our story ends with Delphi defeated, curse reversed, MacGuffin destroyed, order restored, and the day saved. But Harry and company, they still have to figure out all the personal stuff and emotional repercussions. And when we drop the curtain, the entire group, bruised and wounded in more ways than one, agrees to work together to pick up the pieces of all that was broken. So, there you go. The Cursed Child, if I had a crack at rewriting it. Here's why I think my version works better. First, not to beat a dead horse, but most obviously, no more time travel. I went into great detail in my first video about why the Time Turner plotline cheapens the story and becomes an albatross that weighs the entire show down. Don't worry, not gonna repeat that whole spiel again. The point is, with alternate universes and timelines out of the way, we can get back to the roots of what makes Harry Potter great. Harry Potter books are great because Harry Potter books are mysteries, disguises, disguised as fantasy novels. Harry Potter and the Cursed Child fails because it's a time travel story disguised as a Harry Potter story. My version puts the focus back on the mystery, and instead of the wizarding world equivalent of the butterfly effect, we've got a noirish whodunit with a bit of forbidden romance on the side, and a little boarding school adventuring peppered in for an added kick. Secondly, this rewrite works because it pays respect to the original heroes. In the West End play right now, the old crew comes off as clueless, hapless, and profoundly unproductive. I mean, Harry's supposedly the best detective in the wizarding world, yet he does no sleuthing, gets to the bottom of nothing, and spends more time in his pajamas than he does fighting dark wizards. My version changes all that. In this version, Harry's on the case. He's got plenty of action scenes to get our nostalgic hearts pumping. Harry's the title character. He needs to be in it. I understand wanting to introduce a new generation of characters, but that doesn't have to come at the expense of the old ones. In the West End version, we rarely see Ginny, and we barely see Ron, who, I would remind you, was part of the original trio. He deserves stage time. He deserves a storyline. West End delegates him to just a few minutes of comic relief. My version puts both characters right in the middle of the plot as the victims of infidelity. This gives them plenty of meaty scenes to work with as they discover the affair. And I might add, it makes one of them the last minute hero at the end. The lack of Ron? It's actually a symptom of a greater problem with Thorne and Tiffany's screenplay, which is a severe lack of character development. Nobody really grows during their story, at least not in a way that feels meaningful. Rose is underwritten, Scorpius and Albus's friendship feels overwritten, and Harry, Ron, and Hermione just feel like a footnote. All that time travel stuff is a waste of well, time, that could be better used giving both the old crew and the new crew space to explore character flaws and overcome personal challenges. You can't tell me watching Hermione get muscled out of her job as Minister for Magic as she struggles to cover up an extramarital affair while battling a radical group of anarchist dark wizards running amok in Britain is less interesting than a pointless time travel rescue of Cedric Diggory. Look, I'm just saying, if it were me and I was allowed to write a canon story featuring the characters of Harry Potter, you better believe I'ma put him through some stuff. It's an awesome universe and characters that almost all fiction readers are familiar with. If you're a writer, that's an amazing opportunity. Don't throw away your shot. If you've got permission to use the characters, then use them. That leads me to reason three, I prefer my way. My story has stakes. No more of this time travel tomfoolery. The story conflict shouldn't be an etch-a-sketch that you get to wipe clean at the end of every scene. Each choice made by the characters should mean something. There should be some fallout from the action. And in my version, there is. Hermione loses her job. Harry's family becomes tabloid fodder. Both of their spouses lose faith in them, and their kids have a very real chance of dying if the bad guy isn't stopped. In my version, there are serious narrative consequences for every failure. See, look, at the end of the day, you're not allowed to end your story with, they lived happily ever after. Thorn and Tiffany's cursed child leaves no lingering effects, and as a consequence, you don't have very many unanswered questions or speculation about the future. My version leaves the characters triumphant, but never the same. 
The audience walks away from my take wanting to know what happens next. And that's the mark of a winner winner chicken dinner, if I do say so myself. Reason number four, my version creates a memorable new villain. The West End Cursed Child screenplay suffers from the same problem most continuation of huge sagas suffer from. They can't get out of the shadow of the original bad guy. You see it in Star Wars, and you see it here. The big plot twist of Thorne and Tiffany's cut is that Delphi is the illegitimate offspring of Voldemort. Now, this doesn't work for a ton of reasons. If you want them line by line, just look for the longest and most drawn out comments by diehard continuity nerds on my first video. Delphi is Valdi's daughter makes her seem like a second string villain. I mean, think about it. Her only objective is to just bring back another bad guy? How does that make her come off as threatening? Here's a quick story hint. If your new villain's only mission is to resurrect the villain that came before them, you need to come up with a more compelling villain, my friend. Truth is, West End Delphi stinks. She needs to establish herself as an antagonist in her own right and make the audience believe she'll be able to carry on the legacy of evil. My Delphi has no connection to Voldemort, other than, I don't know, maybe using a MacGuffin he created. She's not some 20-something girl with daddy issues. In my version, she's an old, dark witch who manipulates others and works in the shadows to create chaos and destruction. You know what? Make her a hundred years old if you want. Make her ancient, an enemy older and even more experienced than you know who. Voldemort shouldn't be a crutch that all future bad guys have to lean on. Use the Cursed Child to show that villains outside of his orbit can still be compelling and threatening in their own right. Final reason I like my take? It strikes a healthy balance between old school nostalgia and new school novelty. See, audience members really just want two things out of the Cursed Child. First, we want to catch up with the characters we've come to care about over the years. And second, we want to recapture the charm and feel of the original story. Focusing on two main plot lines that influence each other accomplishes this to a satisfying degree. Team OG's story gives you a look at the adult forms of our favorite characters and puts them in new and unique situations that test them in a way we've never seen seen before. Meanwhile, Team Young One's story harkens back to the school days of yesteryear as Albus, Scorpius, and Rose get into hijinks and exploits of their own. Maybe it's just my interpretation, but West End's story has a tendency to feel like the action is always happening elsewhere, and it feels like the more compelling story is always taking place just off screen. My rewrite lets us see our old heroes in action, and our new heroes get a coming-of-age story to boot. Now look, you don't have to agree with this fix 100%. Maybe some parts you like some parts you hate, and that's fine. Point of this vid was to show how the mediocre script currently being used can easily be retooled into something far more compelling. Matter of fact, if the powers that be want to take this pitch and use it themselves, they can have it. Only thing I ask for is front row tickets to the show. Also, use of this guy for an original short film, and a large order of curly fries from Arby's. In that order. <laughs> Look, I'm not stupid enough to actually think that my fix is going to change anything. That's not how showbiz works. But for real, if anybody can prove that this video gets watched by Rolling, Thorn, Tiffany, or any of the show's cast or crew, you'll get your own star on my channel's Hall of Fame. I want to reiterate, as I did in the last video, that I don't doubt the quality of the stage play itself. The cast and crew working on The Cursed Child right now is top-notch. My problems with the story should in no way detract from the highly skilled team working to bring the show to life. These guys are professionals. They're way better than me, and in absolutely no way do I claim to know what I'm talking about. All I know is I started reading The Cursed Child with high hopes, and when I closed the book for the first time ever, I walked away disappointed in something from the Wizarding World universe. So, how do you feel about The Cursed Child? Do you agree with my fix? And most importantly, if you were handed the keys, what would you do differently? Oh, that was a long video to put together. Thanks for watching, folks. Share it if you want, I guess, and like it too. If you want to see more stuff like this, subscribe to my channel for more. Or don't. I don't really care.